Jeremiah 4 and 1, the Lord speaking, If thou wilt return, O Israel, saith the Lord, return unto me. Jeremiah 5, verse 3 and 4. O Lord, are not thine eyes upon the truth? Thou hast stricken them, but they have not grieved. Thou hast consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than a rock. They have refused to return. Therefore I said, Surely these are poor. They are foolish. For they know not the way of the Lord, nor the judgment of their God. In chapter 4, the Lord is saying, Return. And if you do so, return to me. But very quickly, he realizes that they have refused to return. And I want to minister on that one simple word this morning, return. And you may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Return. In Psalms 22 and 9, the psalmist is giving us once again, a great image as he paints a picture with his words. Verse 9 reads, But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst not make me hope when I was upon my mother's breasts. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. And for those of you, we have several or a couple that work in labor and delivery. And we have many mothers in this room that have given birth to a child. But I imagine as we would in the case of a doctor or a practitioner or a midwife, we would imagine a human being of medical background and profession. We will imagine them positioned there as mother is giving birth and that new life is about to enter into this world. And as the psalmist paints the picture, what we are being told is though a doctor or a midwife might be standing there up in front of the doors of life, what we are being told is that God is actually actually the one that is present. God's spirit and what the psalmist is saying that from the very time that he exited the womb, there was God with his divine hands. He was taking him out and embracing him. And even from the belly, this child was cast into the bosom of God. How beautiful. No, no, nothing has transpired from the first breath that is ever taken by man, what we learn from Scripture is that we find ourselves in the hands of God. How blissful it would be. How blissful it would be if we only stayed right there all the days of our lives until our end came and our life expired. In His bosom, enclosed safely and securely enclosed in the lap of God bosom being the lap the midst of God that midsection that we would stay there all the days of our lives it brought me back to the beautiful words of Abigail as she and David would meet and she would intercede on behalf of the new coming king David and this is what she said to him as he was enraged and wanting to take revenge on her then husband she said to David but the soul of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of life with the Lord thy God. 
to think of you and I, to think of our lives, who wouldn't want to be bound in the bundle of life with the Lord God. I think again of the word being used by the psalmist David. That word bosom enclosed and just safely and securely held all the days of our lives. And yet this morning, no matter our age, we sit here today and you and I have experienced enough life to realize all too well that life can in fact be a slippery road comprised of twists and turns that can ever so subtly and easily lead us astray. And as we peer into the parables that were penned by Luke in chapter 15, it proves out this reality. Oh, we would love to have stayed there. I speak for myself. I would have loved to have over the course of 31 years prior to coming to God avoided what lie on the outskirts of the boundary of God's bosom and yet life has a way with its twists and turns of taking us astray. And so when we peer into the parables found in Luke 15 the first gives us insight and it says what man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? And what we see is somehow this one, this lone sheep, was able to slip ever so subtly out of view. Now perhaps... Its sense of direction was dull. One in a hundred. Perhaps it was just that one, the curious one, and something caught its ear, its eye, or its head while it was down grazing. Its, its head was down, but somewhere along the line, its guard was also let down, and it was enticed and ensnared by an undetected danger. We don't know, but we know that in fact it was not the intent, but now the sheep is lost. Perhaps it was a slow drift as the scenery day after day scrolled by with every step that was taken and little by little it just became monotony. But what we do know is this is that this sheep was once among the flock under the watchful eye of the shepherd. And somewhere, somehow, along the way, it went astray. As we continue in Luke, the Bible records either what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she loses one piece, if she does not light a candle, sweep the house and seek diligently until it is found. And in this case, we find a coin, an inanimate object, a coin that is confined in the house, not in the wilderness, not in the wild where it is susceptible and vulnerable, but in the house. And the assumption is that since it's in the house, it is safeguarded and it is insulated from any potential threat of being lost. And yet, in that environment, surrounded by the all too familiar, that unfortunately becomes the fate of the coin. It becomes the fate of the coin. It's gone astray. It's lost. It's not easily accessible and it is unseen. And we get into, and notice we're going from a hundred and we're going to a living being or a living, a, 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 a living breathing animal. We're going to an inanimate coin. And now we're going down to one, one human being, one living of God's children and God's creation. And we get into the parable of the prodigal. And we are given these examples of how and so easily are we susceptible to going astray and being lost. And the Bible reads that the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me 
the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divides unto them his living. And the Bible would tell us that not many days after, the younger son gathered everything that he deemed to be his. Everything in proximity and that would be his possession and takes his journey into a far country. And there, the Bible says, he wasted his substance with riotous living. This parable or the parable of the sheep and the coin, they both seem to ring of randomness. They never intended to end up in that place. They never intended to arrive or fall into that life category of lost. However, the same cannot be said for this younger of the two sons. This, on the other hand, is a well thought out, calculated, intentional decision to withdraw himself from the family, to withdraw himself from the safety of the home, to draw away from that which is all too familiar and also the sufficiency of his father. He draws away on purpose. And this younger son is led astray, hear me, by the adventures that he created in his own imagination. And the bold ambitions and pursuits of his corrupt heart. James would let us know in the New Testament. He would tell you and I, let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. He said, because God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempteth God any man. But James would give us a very sobering truth that every man when he is tempted, is tempted when he or she is drawn away of their own lust and enticed. And James would go on to reveal that when we are drawn away of our own doing, the ultimate end is death. Because when that lust is conceived, it brings forth sin, and sin, when it is finished, it brings forth death. And so for this young man, he too will experience what James is laying out for us. His story would abruptly end in a chaotic series of unforeseen and unfortunate events. And no doubt he would then be found living with the unintended consequences. The end was not the way he imagined or envisioned it in his imaginations while he was still at home. And the bottom line from these three examples given to us in Scripture is this, is that no one, no one, No matter how experienced, no matter how old, no matter where in life you may find yourself, no one is immune from getting or slowly or somehow becoming lost. Nobody. In the house, out of the house, in the wilderness, it does not matter. People in our world today, people in this place, we are prone to getting lost. Now sometimes we are lost unintentionally. Sometimes, like I believe it would be in the case of that lone sheep, it's a slow fade. We just begin to drift day by day, ever so slightly, degree by degree. We get off track and out of trajectory and we find ourselves getting lost. For others, it could be the distractions, the cares of life. We get lost in the distractions. We begin to follow a trail of crumbs that lead us to a place of unintended consequence. We never intended to go, but we tasted one crumb, then another crumb, and now we're fixated on the trail of crumbs. And when we lift our head, it's as if, how in the world did I get here and where am I? Indifference. We get lost in indifference because the monotony, the familiarity, sometimes the truth is, as people, we just stop caring. 
I don't care what happens to me. I don't care where I end up. I don't care where I'm going. And there's no intention. It's just indifference. We don't care. Others uh, along life's path have experienced rejection. And they've experienced bitterness. The bitter taste, uh, if you will, of life. And along the way, somehow we go astray. Other painful experiences that we unfortunately encounter in this thing called life. And then we get lost, perhaps some of us, in bad decisions. More intentional, like the younger prodigal. Bad decisions. And bad decisions, after one after another, they become a, syst- a, a, a series, if you will. And we find ourselves stuck in a vortex where we just can't seem, no matter how willing and desirous on the inside, to make a good decision to interrupt the pattern of bad decisions. And then again, there is getting lost, if you will, in those godly, ungodly pursuits. Some of us, we love danger. We love adventure. And the dreams we dream, we don't realize it. We don't uh, categorize them as such. But they become dangerous dreams uh, like that of the prodigal, inspired by devilish glory. We know that when the enemy took Jesus up and showed him all the glory of the world, he said, you can have all of this. It's a devilish glory, but you can have it if you want to. And people, oh, so many people get lost in dangerous dreams. Perhaps misaligned goals out of God's purpose, never God's plan. Jeremiah would let us know that he formed us. He knew us in the belly and not just knew us in terms of of who we are and by what name we would be called. He knew the purpose and the intent for which he created us and we have misaligned goals because we don't necessarily always want what God wants for us. We want what we've now imagined and what we've invented in our own hearts and minds. And then there are those prideful ambitions that are self-created in the adventurous confines of again our corrupt hearts because that is the state of the human heart. It is deceitful above all things and desperately Wicked when left unbridled. Others get lost in bad relationships. Lost in and amongst bad influences. Perhaps we get lost in even darker alleys of life. We get lost in addiction. Lost in perversion. Lost in the grip of darkness. I don't know what it is for you. I don't know all the time what it is for me. But what we know and understand is that we are all susceptible to God. Going astray. I don't know where you are today. I don't know who you are today. I don't know why God gave me this word today. But let me just tell you. Let me just tell you. The details as to how we arrive at that present destination and condition are not as important As this one point that God has sent me with today. This one point that I've come to drive home. That no matter the twists and the turns that you've taken. No matter how far you have thought yourself or deemed yourself to go from home. From the bosom of God. I want you to know today that God is waiting for you. God is waiting for me with open arms right now today in your present state in your present condition right here and right now God is waiting for you and God's goodness and God's mercy is on your heels it is hot on your heels if only if only you and I will slow down And turn around and return. The mercy and the goodness of God is hot on our heels. It's hot on our heels. I'll never forget, many of you will remember the story that Brother J.H. Osborne Osborne told us of his 16-year-old daughter growing up in a preacher's home. They had a wonderful relationship with their daughter. They had two daughters, the youngest being 16. 
and how that he and his wife, they come home one day and her room is empty. She's nowhere to be found. And when Brother Osborne was here in 2017, I believe 2018, and even after, I think since uh, the rest of the story has at least uh, turned the page uh, and we know a little bit more. But I can't tell you for some 30 some odd years, they have a daughter in their home and their loving parents and it's a godly home and they're in ministry. And the next thing you know, they come home one random day and she is gone. And it's some 30 some odd years that this incredible man of God and his wife have no idea, no trace, no note. The car is found. They have no idea whether she's dead or whether she's alive. But can I tell you, I promise you, on the day, if it hasn't happened already, on the day that that daughter would have walked through the doors of the Osborne home, I can promise you they're not going to want to know what happened, what went wrong, where were you, what have you been doing every day of your life for the last 30 plus years I can promise you that that father his arms are going to be open wide that father is going to be on his feet and that father is only going to want to know one thing my child has returned home the arms of our God are open wide in spite of what we may believe the sheep Hear me today. The sheep, the coin, and the prodigal may not have known fully how they got there. You may not know how you got there. You may not know what in the world happened to me. Where did I take a wrong turn? How did I ever get here? How did I ever go this far? But I can tell you, it is only they, the sheep, the coin, and the prodigal. Only they knew exactly where they were, even though they were lost. Only you and I know exactly where we are today, lost or not. Only you and I can truly pinpoint where we are today. And we may go astray and we may lose proximity to our Heavenly Father. But He never, I want you to say never, God never loses sight nor the awareness of our location. Never loses the awareness of our location. The psalmist said, where can I go from your spirit, God? Or where shall I flee from thy presence? He said, if I ascend up to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell, thou art there. Let me tell you, you got to make a lot of wrong twists and turns to end up and to make a bed in hell. But it doesn't matter how. He said, God, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, if I go adrift to a point and a place of no return, even there shall your hand lead me. Your right hand shall hold me. Your right hand shall be my strength. And if I say the darkness shall cover me. If I get to a place where I am shrouded by darkness. If I've gone down a dark alley and I can't find my way out of the pit of perversion or darkness or drugs or addictions or whatever else has me bound on the darkest of days even the night shall be light about me yea the darkness cannot hide from you God but the night shines as the day and they are both the same to God so I don't care today if you're in the bright sunshine or if you're in the darkest place you've ever been in your life I'm telling you that God knows exactly where you and I are God knows exactly where you're living. He knows exactly your point of location. He knows. He knows. And his arms are open wide. And I can tell you today that whether we are born in the house, there's many of us, we've been born in church. This is all we know. This is our family, if you will, religion. Or whether or not you've been adopted into the family. Somewhere along the way, you did not know this from birth. But somewhere along the way, you've been adopted into the family. I'm here to tell you that from the very beginning, that God has 
has always been and will always be your chief cornerstone. He will always be the foundation from which you were built up and built upon. And God will always and is always our Father and more than our Father, hear me today, more than our Father, just as it was being cast upon His bosom from birth, God is always home. He's always home. I've told it, I'll tell it till the day I die. I love so very much that first day, April the 23rd in the year 2000. Life and its twists and turns. And I found myself, we found ourselves in a place I would have never imagined. I've said it a hundred times, if not more. I would have never dreamed in a billion years I'd live in Louisiana. I would have never dreamed in a million years because I was that younger prodigal. And I had this adventure mapped out in my mind. I had a life created in my own imagination. I saw destinations. I saw experiences. I saw adventures. I saw possessions and accomplishments and all types of things in my own mind and in my own creativity. And I never would have dreamed that I found myself where I ended up in life. And if you say, how did you get here? I can give you details to a story, but truly, 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 I don't know. It's one wrong turn and another twist and another U-turn and another, you know, just you, you don't know. But when I walked into the doors of a Pentecostal church for the first time, and it's not about the building, it's not about the denomination, it wasn't about the, it wasn't about the church service, it was walking in to the presence of God, my Father upon whose bosom I was cast from birth. When I walked into the doors of that house on that day and lifted my hands like some of you have done today, I heard as it were the audible words of God say, you are finally home. You are finally home. Let me just tell you, God is home. God is home. This building's not your home. His presence, our heavenly Father, God is home. The psalmist in Psalm 90 and 1, this is what he said, Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were brought forth. Or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. And thou, watch this, thou turnest man to destruction and sayest, return, you children of men, return. Now, now, I, I, I'm, I'm going to get into some areas in, this, in, 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 in Scripture. My intention with all of my heart is not to go negative on you. But let me tell you, sometimes we've got to dive into the, into the, the meteor realms and dimensions of the Word of God, those prophecies and those prophets, and we hear the doom and the gloom and the, and the prophecy. What we, what we, we have to get beyond that. And what we have to be searching for and seeking for, at least as is my assignment today, is to help us understand the nature and the heart of God. And we get revelation by contrast. So I am not coming after how we got to where we may be. But I do want us to get a glimpse of the nature of God. The psalmist said, you turn man to destruction. And you say to man, return, you children of men. It gives us insight into the heart of God. Because so many times, the struggles that we encounter or that we are encountering along the way as we find ourselves wandering through life. These struggles are intended by God, placed in our path by God in, in, in providence. They are providentially placed there and they are designed to draw you and I back. 
The prodigal is there in a foreign country. He's got a pocket full of money. He has got a boldness. He has got a daring about him. He is not dreaming that his destiny is ending up living and wallowing with the swine. He has never planned for that. But I promise you that somewhere along the way, God understood that unless this young child, unless this boy comes into, into some situation that's going to wake him up and cause there to be a bringing back of him and the intended purpose for his life. I'm going to tell you right now, there needed to be a pig pen. There needed to be a famine. There needed to be poverty. There needed to be these things in this prodigal's life. Now, here's what we automatically think. And you and I, we think like this. We automatically look look and we are so quick to deem it as God's punishment. These struggles, these, these, these obstacles, these, 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 these devastating situations, these barriers, and we immediately go and what it does is if we're not careful, it will feed our lostness. It'll feed our, our fuel, our going astray because we look and we say, you see, God doesn't love me. You see, what's the point? You see, he's not merciful. You see, he's not faithful. And if we're not careful, they are not God's punishment as we're quick to presume but rather I submit to you they are God's mercies they are God's mercies reaching for every one of us in hopes that there will come a point where the pleasure is not as where the pain where, where that pleasure plain pleasure pain principle kicks in and the pain becomes greater than the pleasure and you and I will ultimately return and make our way back home. Home. He said God will turn us to destruction. Now Hosea 6 and 1, listen to what Hosea, again we're, we're going deeper because we want to understand the nature of God. He said, come and let us return unto the Lord. He, for he hath torn, saying God is torn, but watch, he will heal us. God hath smitten, but don't, don't fret, because he wants to bind us. It says that after two days, he wants to revive us. And in the third day, I'm a mess lately. If I'm not falling down and falling out and fainting or tripping or stumbling, I'm sneezing. After two days, he'll revive us. On the third day, he'll raise us up and we'll live in his sight. And watch, then we shall know. And if we go on to know the Lord, if we will stay with it upon our return, his going forth is as prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, and he will refresh our lives. So the call is to return. The call is to return. The reality is somewhere along the way, God has torn and God has smitten, but the desire of God in it all, the purpose, the purpose of God in it all is to ultimately heal us, to bind us up, to revive us, to raise us up. In other words, what God is saying is if you're looking for restoration, restoration does not happen apart from me. The only chance and the only hope that you and I will ever have for restoration is first returning to God. He wants to refresh us. He wants to heal us. He wants to bring us back into good standing. He would go on in Hosea to say of Ephraim, Ephraim, he has mixed himself among the people. He got lost. He was the chosen of God, the redeemed of the Lord. But somehow Ephraim, the tribe, and all of its constituents, they got mixed up among the people. And in verse 9, he said what? Strangers have devoured his strength. And he doesn't even know it. He doesn't know what's happening to him. It was a slow fade. His gray hairs are here and there upon him. And watch, he doesn't even know it. Have you ever wondered to yourself? Have you ever gotten to that point 
where you just say, you know what? I'm just sick and I'm tired. I'm exhausted. It's one thing after another. And we fight and we do everything imaginable and everything possible in our human effort to somehow regain strength and to somehow shake off that fatigue. What he's saying is that we don't even realize when we look in the mirror that we're getting gray headed. We don't realize that the days are going by. The years are passing. Time is flying by and we're still struggling trying to find our own strength and find our own way. And watch in verse 10 he says it's the pride of Israel. The pride of of Israel is testifying to his own face and they do not return to the Lord their God nor seek him for all of this. For all of what? For all of the trouble and for all of the turmoil and for all of the resistance and for all of the weariness because sometimes God will allow us to go but he will strategically and lovingly create situations and bring us to a place of conditions where we somehow, his hope, God's hope, he's not looking for excuses to come down and beat us up over the head and punish us for how we got lost or where and how we went astray. That's not his desire. God's desire is to bring us to a point where the pain becomes so great, where the pleasure is so dull that we ultimately wake up and shake ourselves and say, you know what? I've got to get back to God. I've got to get back to God because that's where my strength is. That's where my restoration is. That, that's where my healing is. I've got to get back to God. But he said it was their pride. Their pride, because we can become so prideful in our mistakes, so prideful in our missteps, in our lost way. We can become so prideful that we don't even begin to seek God for all of the things that are going on in our lives. He says, when they go, see if this at all sounds familiar to some of us, or perhaps at some point in your life. When they shall go, I'll spread my net upon them. In other words, if they just keep continuing to go, trying to figure out on a, God said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put my net over them. And I'm going to bring them down as the fowls of heaven. And watch, he said, I'm going to chastise them. I'm going to keep correcting them. These are my children. I'm going to keep correcting them until they return, until they get it right, as the congregation have heard. He said, woe unto them, woe unto them. They have fled from me. They have fled from me. They left home. They packed their bags. They went astray. They got lost. They didn't mean to. Intentionally, unintentionally, they have lost their way and fled from me. And though I have redeemed them, they have transgressed against me. They have spoken lies against me. And watch. And they have not cried unto me with their heart when they howled upon their beds. And they assembled for themselves corn and wine. They're trying to sustain themselves. And he said, they're rebelling against me. And even though I have bound them and strengthened their arms, even though I've got them in, in, a, in a headlock, even though I've got their arms tied or their hands behind their backs, yet do they continue to imagine mischief against me. He said this, they return, watch, they return, but not unto the Most High. Notice Jeremiah 4 and 1. If thou return, says the Lord, return unto me. Because you can wind up, if you're not careful, returning, but going back and returning to the very things that you once had false hope in, thinking that can do it for you. But God is saying, no, no, no. If you're going to return, don't go back to those things. Don't go back to those previous places. Don't go back to the points where you made your last mistake. Don't go back and try and figure it out on your own. God is saying, if you're going to return, return to me. Come home to me. I've got my net over you. I'm trying to correct you. I'm doing everything I can to get your attention 
attention because I want you to come home to me. I want you to return. I want you to be healed. I want you to be raised up. I want you to be revived. Jeremiah would say it like this in 3 and 21. Watch, a voice was heard in the high places, weeping and supplication of the children of Israel, for they have perverted their way and they have forgotten the Lord their God. Again, we're listening for the heart and the nature of our heavenly Father. They have forgotten the Lord their God. He said, return, backsliding children, and watch. He's not saying return so we can go through it all and I can beat you up over your mistakes. Return so I can tell you all the things you did wrong and show you where you made the wrong decisions and punish you for it. No, no, no. He said, return, you backsliding children, and I will heal your backslidings. God is not interested so much in how you got to where you may be. He is interested more so in healing you. But he said, behold, he said, behold, we're coming unto you because you are our God. We're coming back to you because that's where it all began with you. We're coming back because you are our God. Now, returning implies that you've been there before. You can't return to some place you've never been. But he said, returning implies that you have been there before. It means literally to come or to go back to a place or a person. And I would submit for this, for this framing of the message today that God is home. His bosom was home. His thoughts and plans for our lives is home. His word is home. His presence is home. And we may not have recognized that we were there from birth, but God was there when we were born. And God had a plan from the very beginning. He saw the end from the beginning. And what it is saying is that we are to come back. We are to come or to go back to a place or a person. And I understand this morning, I understand that we are all here. I understand you're here today. I understand that you're in the house today. I understand that the overwhelming majority of us are faithful to that which has become so familiar and you're present today. But can I say to you something that is so true yet often hard to hear and, 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 and recognize as a reality is that we can be present in body, yet we can be absolutely so absent in heart from this house. We can be present, but we can also simultaneously be so incredibly absent. And I would ask, I would ask the question that God asked Adam, not to shame and not to condemn. But where are we? Where are you, Adam? I don't need to know how you got here. But I want to know where you are. Because identifying where we are is the first, is the, is, it's the starting point for God's restoration in our lives. You cannot return if you don't know where you're beginning. And I'm telling you today, I feel it so deeply in my spirit that God is reckoning or beckoning, excuse me. He is beckoning for us to return to him today. He's, he's, he's beckoning for us to return. I don't know if, you, if you're like me, but when you, when you read the scripture, I wonder what my story would look like if it, if it were being written in the Bible. I wonder what my story would look like if I were looking at the holy pages of Scripture as God was divinely inspiring and recording my story. I know that we have a hard time sometimes with God putting a net over us or putting destruction or turning us to difficulty and putting these obstacles in our path. But I, 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 you read in the Word of God, again, from a, from a different point of view, and you understand that so much of what goes on in our lives 
So much is so orchestrated succinctly and strategically by God. When Solomon's son Rehoboam becomes king, simultaneously because of his, uh, his, just, his stubborn and prideful way to not heed the counsel of the elders, he raises up Jeroboam who fled from his father Solomon and is in Egypt. And in Egypt he hears that Solomon is dead and Rehoboam is on the throne and he comes and they pose a question and Rehoboam rejects the counsel of the elders and the next thing you know Jeroboam is back in Jerusalem there's a splitting of the tribes there's a tearing apart of the kingdom and we're reading that and it's like oh my gosh Lord everything's falling apart that you brought together under David and under Solomon but what you read in scripture is it says but this thing was of the Lord see we live it out and we deem it to be punishment or difficulty or a rejection of God or God not loving us. And what we don't have the privilege of understanding is what things have happened to you and me. What things have occurred in our lives that if we were seeing our story written in scripture, it would say, for this thing was of the Lord. It was inspired. It was, it was ignited. It sparked as a catalyst for something else to unfold, to bring about God's purpose and for God's glory can I tell you your story is not finished and there are things that have happened in our lives situations that have occurred that we may question but could it be that God said I allowed this thing to happen because I am trying to get you to return to me? Can I tell you I've been there, you've been there perhaps you're there but you've just not diagnosed it as such because things aren't going to get easier. We want ease. We want relief. We want a way out. We want a loophole. But there are some things that perhaps we are struggling with and struggling in because God is waiting for us to cry uncle. Those of you that went to the marriage retreat, well, that'll be for another day. He's waiting for us to cry uncle. He's waiting for us to return to him. He's saying, okay, you can keep on going in your stubborn, stubborn way and you can have a prideful face and you can have a hard heart, but I'm waiting for you to come to me because that's where the relief is. That's where the ease is. That's where the, re the, the, the replenishing and the refreshment is. And could it be that right now, see, we're looking for other solutions. We're, we're looking for other avenues and other explanations. And God could very simply be saying, no, no, no. I am waiting for you to return home. And I'm not going to let up until, because you never see where God, over, where God is overpowered by the will of the people. You, ne you never see. What happens is, is that consequently, God ultimately just continues to add. He just continues to add. But what we also see in Scripture that we don't like to see in our own selves, you get all the way into the book of Revelation and you see these judgments and these vials and all these horrendous things that are going to come on the earth. And what we do see is a true picture of the heart of mankind. Because it gets to a point where it is so intolerable, yet men will chew their tongues and they will continue to blaspheme God rather than fall to their knees and find a place of repentance, which is a way of returning to God. So you've got these two opposing forces just fighting. God said, I'm not bending. And man said, well, I'm not giving up either. I'm sticking with it. I'm, I'm sold out to this. And you can be sold out and I can be sold out to a wrong way and we can continue to remain lost or we can turn around and fall to our knees and we can repent and we can return to God. And my first call this morning is not to those necessarily that are already in the house, but my call is to those that are listening online. My call is to those that are here. You know that you're not home yet. And God is beckoning for you to return today. Today is the day of return and the first day of the rest of your life and the remainder of your God story. I don't know who you are today. I'm not here to single anyone out. But I am sending out a clear sound that God is calling someone to return today. 
And I trust that the majority of us, as you stand with me, the majority of us, I would trust this, that the majority of us are not altogether astray, but this I would submit, that perhaps there are aspects of our lives, P-O-M, of our walk with God, P-O-M, in which we have wandered away. And though we would not deem ourselves or categorize ourselves as lost in life, and yet like the coin, we're in the house, though there are certain elements and aspects of our life and our walk with God that have been misplaced. It's time to return. If that's you, it's time to return. Some of us, perhaps we need to return to our first love. Perhaps we're here, we're committed, we, 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 we don't want to leave proximity to the Father's house, but our passion is not once where it was, and it's gone astray. It's time to return to our first love. Perhaps for some of us today, it's time to return to our priorities of the kingdom of God, seeking it first and all of his righteousness to seek the kingdom. Perhaps for some of us, it's just a facet of our lives. But to return to our disciplines of prayer and fasting. God laid it so heavily on me. It's time to return. It's time to return, perhaps in our devotion. We're, we're going through the motions. We're in the house, but we're not in the Word. we got to get in the Word. Perhaps our posture has straightened out. Our knees have stiffened, and we have lost the posture of a servant and servitude. It's time to return and to bend the knee and to bow the heart. Hallelujah. It's time for our countenance to return to one of joy. And one of gladness. And get rid of that hard face of pride and rebellion. Perhaps for others, it's time for us to return to submission to God's Lordship. And return to obedience to God and His Word. Hallelujah. Oh, you're in the house. You're in the house. But the clay is not as pliable as it once was. You're in the house, but you're not as obedient as you once were. You've got all the answers now. You know everything now. Ha. Ah, and I'm telling you, God's saying, return to a humble and an obedient spirit. Return. For some of us, perhaps it's time to return to a life of purity. Return, you're in the house, but somewhere along the way, you begin to be daring and adventurous. Somewhere along the way, you begin to create your own dreams and to romanticize about a life that is only filled with danger in the end. It's time to return to a life of purity and separation. Come on, I don't know where you are today, but I know this. Every one of us has an area of our lives. It's time to return. And I'm telling you, in the Holy Ghost, you don't have to struggle. It doesn't have to be this hard. It doesn't have to be difficult. God, God will lift that net. He'll let the hands go that are found behind your back. God will ease and raise you up and refresh. But it's time to return. It's time to return. But in our opening text, this is what God said in our opening text. He said, I've stricken them and they've not grieved. They've got a custom. Listen, they've become adjusted. They've become comfortable living in this condition of being grieved. They've just learned to live with it. I've consumed them. But they refuse to receive correction. They're going to continue doing it their own way. They made their faces harder than a rock. And God said, I wanted them to return. I'm begging for them to return. I'm putting obstacles in their way so they can return. I'm draining their strength so that they can return. I'm making it as difficult as I can in my mercy so that they would return. But God said in the end, they have refused to return. 
I'm telling somebody today, in the Holy Ghost, return. Just return. You say, well, Pastor, I don't even know where to begin, Pastor. It's been years. Pastor, I feel so lost even though I'm in the house. Pastor, I, I don't even know how to begin to explain to you or to God where I am today. It doesn't matter. What matters is this. If you notice in the prodigal, in the prodigal's life story, he never gets back home to the father and begins to go through and replay the story. He never begins to excuse away how he got to where he got to. But this is what he said. He came to himself. He came to himself. One sober moment in time. One window of time where he was sober enough to understand I'm not where I need to be. I'm not home. And he realizes that in order for me to be restored and for my life to look like it once did and perhaps so much more, I've got to return. But until I return, there's no restoration. He didn't try to find a clinic, a counselor, a, a pharmacy, a therapist in that foreign land. No, no, no. He knew I've got to get back home. And I pray for somebody, I don't care if it's one person, that today be that one moment in time where you could see so clearly where you are. And then it says this, I will arise and go. It's one simple decision. He doesn't say, I got to have all the details. I got to figure out how this is going to work. I got to figure out how am I going to get my life back together. How am I going to put together all the broken people? No, no, no. He said, I don't, I don't know any of that. I've made such a mess. I'm so far. All I know is this. I will arise and I'll start heading and returning home. That's all you have to do today. It's one decision and it's one step toward home. Who, who are you? Who are you? And where are you? Because we can dress, we can dress in the finest clothes. We can be decked out from head to toe, be saying all the right colloquialisms, have all the right words and the right smile, but only you and I know truly where we are today. And God knows God is calling someone to return today. Just one decision. I've got to get home. I will arise and I will go. And God says all the rest of it, if you notice through the scripture, in Jeremiah and Hosea, all the rest of it is God's responsibility. God said, I'll heal them. I'll restore them. I'll raise them up. I refresh them. I put them back right in their perfect place in the Father's house. These altars are open. You're here. But it takes more than just standing here. I'm looking today for those honest hearts that are going to have a dialogue with God. You're going to take that one step, perhaps out of your seat and toward this altar. You are going to leave here today saying, you know what? Today's the day. God, I don't know what it looks like. I don't know what to do from here. But God, I am returning and I am running home to you. I don't know who you are. I don't know where you are. But it's time to return. These altars are open. It's between you and God. Don't refuse to return today. Make your way. Let today be the beginning of the rest of your life and the rest of your God story. long enough you've been lost long enough 
surrender. Put your hands up and say, God, I don't know how I got here, but I'm ready to return. I'm coming home. Come on, this is not, I, I didn't, I'm not preaching just a pretty sermon to preach to you or to try to impress you today. I'm telling you, April 23rd in the year 2000 was the first day of the rest of my life. I left knowing I had finally gotten home. Did I have it all figured out? No. Did everything go easy from that day forward and just immediately fall into place? No. But I knew in my heart I was home. That's what I want somebody to leave with today. I'm home. And you're not alone, but you're home. You're home. There's family at the Father's house. Just get home. Just get home. He'll work it out. He'll help you. He'll work through the difficulties. He'll work through the process. Just get home. Just get home. One decision in one moment of time. I'm begging somebody to make the return today. Don't stay lost. Here I am.